Hi, and welcome to Decoding AQ, helping you to learn the tools, mindsets, and actions to thrive in an ever-changing world. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Decoding AQ. Today, we're joined by Michael Keane, and he's a CHRO, Strategic Innovative Change Director, and a fascinating background, plethora of experience. So I can't wait to share the insights that he will uh, share with us today. Um, your background has come from a whole range of different uh, roles, industries and areas. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more, but at the moment you're the managing partner of the Sierra Institute. And so you can tell us a bit more about that. So yeah, please introduce yourself uh, with your story and a little bit of some of your background. It'd be really great, Michael. Well, it's great to be invited here today, Ross. So thank you very much for the opportunity to chat with you. But uh, 30 years, I feel, I feel older every time I get to tell the story. Uh, so, um, but 30 years in corporate HR roles, if you will, uh, companies like Whirlpool, uh, in retail Express and Victoria's Secret, and, and most recently with P.F. Chang. So large distributed workforces, uh, if you will, consumer facing exclusively almost. Uh, today, I'm an independent consultant uh, advising companies on how to organize themselves differently, more effectively, and also on leadership, uh, how to make their leadership more effective. And uh, as it regards the Sierra Institute, it's a consortium invitation only of, of heads of HR of companies across industries within the United States. And I've been around for almost 15 years. And so I'm one of three managing partners in that organization. And so uh, we're focused on how to make the function best the best it can possibly be if you will so that's the that's the thumbnail sketch if you will the thumbnail the sketch yeah. i think you know any anybody who's been doing something for 30 years uh will have i'm sure gained loads of thoughts of wow i wish i uh, could do that again To i'm glad <laughs> yeah. i did that and everything in between uh and in fact uh, when i was preparing for this uh your last role you mentioned was at pf chang's my uh, wife's parents used to live in Florida and for 20 years we'd be going and visiting them and P.F. Chang's was one of our uh, favorite places to go. So I thought, oh, this will be fascinating. And, um, you know, I know this won't necessarily go out live straight away, but for reference, you know, we're right in the middle of COVID. Um, you know, it's 21st of April and restaurants, um, you know, <laughs> the world over are having a really tough time right now. Um, I can't even fascinating. It's, it's, it's almost, it's fascinating because uh, my oldest uh, stepson is actually a manager at Chang's in Ohio right now. And, and they, they were the number one restaurant uh, a year ago. So they, they're going up against great numbers and, and his restaurant just doing drive through is, is, is doing actually exceedingly well, if you will. So mm -hmm. it's just really interesting time. Uh, some restaurants are clearly not going to make it. Uh, out of this and and yet uh, and that some restaurants are clearly going to come out okay and, and they'll probably modify their their model there I have no doubt that uh, that Chang's is probably learning a lot um, no longer with the company obviously they had a change of control um, and and most of us in the leadership team uh, left but um, I have little doubt that they're learning a lot about how to do their business differently and possibly more profitably as a result of this. And it's, it's so funny. It, it plays into the cop topic of adaptability, right? Um, yep. And sometimes you adapt because you're, you choose to, and other times you adapt because you have to. And, uh, and, and, and so organizations right now today are, are adapting because they have to. And, uh, and, and so he, uh, Chang's is one of those organizations. In terms of your history of each of these, you know, as you expressed, distributed large workforces, you know, these are tens of thousands of um, human lives, you know, yeah. families, communities that represent in a lot of these enterprise organizations. And what's perhaps been for you some of your favorite highlights of different experiences perhaps that might be relevant today you know maybe big changes or things that happened that we might be able to learn from that you can uh, perhaps share thinking back yeah i, I would say probably the, the the easiest one instance was the most dramatic change that i was a part of making i was it was during uh it was now gosh 
uh, it'll be 12, it'll be 12 years ago this coming summer, I was with a company called Tween Brands. So Tween is the, is the, um, is the description of, of uh, typically, well, girls, but it's that age between uh, your, uh, your junior years and then your, your teenage years, right? So is the term, uh, that term for those years. So typically uh, eight, to, eight to 11 years, seven to 11 years of age, right? And so I was with the, the business that coined that term from a retail standpoint. So um, uh, for those, those, those of you that are listening, if you've had daughters, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so I was with the business that, uh, that had created that space in retail called, uh, it was called uh, Tween Brands um, from a stock ticker standpoint. And, uh, and we, we, were, we were the brand, the business that had created Limited 2, T-O-O. And, and, and so it was a very successful, uh, almost a billion dollar business. And it was iconic at the time, but this was in 2008. And so this was pre-Great Recession. And we had, we had uh, a very successful business, but we saw the storm clouds coming. We did not forecast the Great Recession. Uh, we weren't that smart but we just saw the storm clouds growing. And so we had that business that had about 680 stores and it was, and, it, and, and the business had started to plateau and was starting to go into some measure of decline. And we had another business that we had started to build called Justice. And it was, it was a price about 20 to 25% below and it was a real estate place. So it was going into strip malls, whereas limited two was in all the really good malls. And, uh, and so Limited 2 was starting to decline and Justice was, was kicking its tail. And we could see that in the re weekly results. And, um, and so we, we made the bet that, um, that we to, to actually save the business, we thought that we needed to, uh, we made the strategic shift to get rid of the Limited 2 brand and change all the stores to Justice nameplate, even though Justice was a fraction of the size of Limited 2. And, um, and there was a lot of, uh, internal angst about that decision. And boy, um, the external angst with the security analysts was five times as great as the internal angst. So, so much so that the day that we announced that, um, the stock went down 40%. What the strategic change enabled us to do though, was we had a built up a lot of internal costs to manage two different brands separately. And we were getting paid nothing for it when you took a look at it. So for a whole bunch of reasons, we couldn't figure out any positive outcomes from doing this strategy. So we took out in one day, we took out 110 jobs in, in, our, lo in our home office. So 110 people got terminated in one day. And my organization uh, had never gone through anything like this. It was a, it was a fairly young organization. Um, we were kind of, I'm going to use the word juvenile in, in, without trying to be disparaging, but we were juvenile in our thought process about these things. And it fell on me, of course, to help try and manage that in a humane way, if you will. Yeah. And we were publicly traded, so we had to communicate in a way that was fair both to our public obligations and to our internal, so forth and so on. So I don't need to get into details for this, but, but to do that in a way that was thoughtful and, uh, and responsible was, was a bit of a trick logistically, and then, um, and then all that distributed workforce, all those lives. Um, so there were the lives in, in Columbus, Ohio, where we were based, and then there were the lives out into the workforce because there were 680 stores that had limited two on their nameplate. And the immediate reaction was, we're shutting all those stores down. Well, no, we're not. But then you had to go out and convince those people. So you go out and you do something, which I'd never done before, called road shows. So you do an executive road show. Now I've, not, I've now done that at two other companies and it was a remarkable experience. You literally get on planes and you go out and you bring people together and you tell them, you go make the case for what you're doing. And it's a fascinating and a highly effective experience, but it's like a political campaign almost. You go do those things. And I, I did that at Chang's when we changed the culture at Chang's. And, um, and I'm actually working with a client today. I'm not going to go into that specifics, but, but I've actually proposed that they're considering a significant change in their field. And, and it's, it's, uh, and I think it'll work if we do it there. And so, uh, it's a fascinating learning experience that I think can be replicated. And, and what I learned about this is when you make a change to someone's life, you got to be able to, whatever the change is, you got to be able to survive the, what I call across the table, eyeball to eyeball conversation. 
And if you can't sell it to someone sitting across the table from them, then you probably don't have it right. <laughs> it's as simple as that. It's interesting because you, you talk about, um, you know, experience where you as an internal team, juvenile or not, were looking at a strategic decision to pivot and adapt the organization to provide a better future. So you look at the situation, you look at the market, you look at your numbers and say, okay, in one example, this brand's declining, this one's increasing, we're going to shift. So there's going to be a series of um, requirements from redoing the store sign to shift of personnel and then falling on certain individuals, as you, like you said, to do that in a humane way of having conversation with human beings and employees about that change. What fascinates me about the time we're in at the moment is a lot of it's happening from an external burning platform and the changes are not brought out where you've perhaps sold it to yourselves. You've done all of the things that you're excited about it and you're going, right, this is how I can sit eyeball to eyeball and say, we got you. You know, the future's going to be a okay yep. Now let's go. And that roadshow comes from a sense of internal excitement. How might um, people use that same strategy of being able to go out and be humane, have conversations, uh, communicate? Maybe it's much more virtual right now, but how can they do that maybe when it's not been um, even well thought out of what they're communicating or that it's intent. More it's reactionary. reactionary. Yeah. yeah. So what, no, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah. Yeah. It's a really thoughtful question. I think that, you know, I, I think you get to the same place by how you contextualize your reaction. Right. So in my mind, the number one, one of the, the number one job that a leadership team has is they have to recognize the, re, the prevailing reality. And that's what people expect of their leaders, right? Um, when I've seen people quit on their leaders in organizations, it's because they don't think that they're choosing to, to recognize the prevailing reality. And therefore they think, you know, these guys just don't get it. And uh, that's when people therefore then say, wow, I'm not sure that I'm playing for the right group of people. And so I think if you, you that in this world, especially when it's external, um, you walk out and you, you just lay your cards out and you say, this is what the reality is. This is what's happened to us. This is how we're reading it. And you go make your case, right? And so um, every time I've done one of these road shows, um, the way we've structured them is we make the case for change. And so you just are substituting the set of data that's the case for change is, is fundamentally how I, I would structure it. And in terms of some of the challenges with that change is, how might some of the leaders who are feeling vulnerable, who might not either know the answers, so like you say, you know, understand the prevailing reality and communicate that, what if them themselves are feeling so uncertain, so under pressure, where would you draw the line between complete transparency or no, leaders need big shoulders. You need to take some of this and show up in this kind of fashion to say, you know, where's the balance in that for, for people that might be in a leadership role that may be struggling? How can you advise and help them to think about their communication flow with their teams? Well, I mean, that's, that's where I think it, it falls on certainly the, the person who holds the role that I've held um, in, in, you know, in my past, um, I think that, uh, whether fair or unfair, I think that's part of what you sign up for, uh, when you become the head of whatever the, the title is at the moment. Um, and I think that, you know, the most powerful form of, of, uh, of how you lead is how you, how you show up every day. That's why the Sierra Institute exists, quite frankly, um, you know, uh, TSI, as we call it, exists because we believe that the, the, the head of HR role is the loneliest job on the C-suite team. Because uh, to do it right, we think that you do have, in some cases, especially in times of stress, the broadest shoulders. Uh, because, because everyone, including the CEO, it should be leaning on you. And the, uh, 
and, and who do you get to lean on <laughs> except other people who have your job. So, so that's, and, and I digress on that part, but I, I do fundamentally think that especially during times of stress, um, a high performing head of HR should be the person that goes to and, and leans into and, and says, come on, I'm your person to lean on, on and, uh, and, and should be the person who holds up that mirror to the C-suite people and says, this is a time for you to be your best. And, um, and, and you being stressed is okay. It's part of you being human. And, and, and we don't want people during times of uh, adversity to be anything less than human because, you know, whatever version of that uh, is for each personality type is part of what makes people resonate with people, uh, you know, with their leaders. Um, now, you still have an accountability to lead. So what we need to do is figure out how you're going to lead and do the work of leading uh, effectively. But yeah. it doesn't mean you stop being, you know, you become an automaton. <laughs> I, I think it's um, exactly where um, you mentioned Sierra Institute and other peer organizations and alliances really come into their own is, you know, great sailors are made in choppy seas, All right, exactly. We're in choppy seas right now. So what an opportunity for every leader to see just how good they can be and deciding to lean in using your peers and your community of likes to gain strength to then go and face your role that you have uh, chosen so i think that's a huge opportunity maybe a benefit for the communications of peer and alliances and groups is so essential right now um, to leverage that and be able to show up super vulnerable um, and gain the strength from everyone together to go back with that energy to your organization and be what everyone needs you to be. No, point's really, really well made, I agree. And, and to, to take that point and extend it just a touch, um, I think that one of the unintended consequences of this is that every organization this is a huge real-time test of whatever their succession plan is looking like right now. I mean, you are getting a real-time test of, oh, we thought that person, we, we thought person A was really a successor. Eh, maybe not, you know, or wow, is this a confirmation of what we really thought about her or him? So uh, your points are really, really well made in a it, whole bunch of ways. It's that um, challenge of A players and how are they nurtured? How are they made? Were they already there? Um, just waiting to be discovered or did the opportunity make them and it, it kind of leads me on to another thing that I'd, I'd like um, to to share with our audience in terms of you've seen multiple challenges you talked about the specifics of one organization transcending from one brand to another um, and you know the 87 financial impact you know 2000 2008 there's been lots of different situations that you've lived through have you seen or is there any stories that stick in your head of where teams or leadership or organizations have, um, you know, transformed well? And what were the key skills that showed up? You know, was it communication skills? What were the things in those periods? Maybe it's back to your example of justice, that story. What skills made it possible to, to transform into something better and a, a brighter future? Well, I mean, to complete the justice story, which ended up being a, a home run, um, uh, you know, it, the strategy worked. And the, and, and the reason that it worked is because, uh, and, and, and the alert to your question, it hits the heart of your question is, is um, it worked in my mind because the strategy did not ask the organization to do that many things differently than it already knew how to do. And so my takeaway is that when you when you ask an organization to transform you have to think to some extent what you're asking the organization to do differently from what it already knew how to do and 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 as you and and, and as i think about adapting it, it it actually completely res resonates with on an individual basis too you know the 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 more you ask yourself to do differently if you're thinking about on an individual basis if you're asking yourself to become something so traumatically different than you already are obviously the risk is you know just stands to reason they i the likelihood that you're going to transform 
it obviously lessens the more significantly you're asking yourself to become. If, if you ask me to become a power lifter, you know, anyone who sees me knows the likelihood that's going to happen pretty darn low, but you know, um, so forth and so on. We can go on and on about that. But, uh, but if you're asking an organization that's been in, in the case of, of, of tween, um, it was all, we, we, we were not shifting its requirements in this transformation to be all that dramatically different. Uh, it already knew how to develop product and knew how to develop be a fast fashion company, all that kind of stuff. We were just mildly shifting the angle of what we were asking it to be. Um, in, in terms of uh, when I was involved with Victoria's Secret and we, we, we changed that model fairly significantly uh, it became very successful. I, I wasn't there because I had moved on to tween by the time they put that into full motion. It was, it, it, it ensued. What happened there after I left was five years of record performance. Um, that ensued uh, by and large because we changed the way we organized and we made some slight tweaks in that organizational model. But fundamentally, again, we didn't ask them to do things that they didn't know how to do already as well. We just put a different context in place. So I, my lift up is the more, the more you can keep the organization using muscles that it already had, but just change the context for how they use those muscles, obviously the more likely you are to get it done. Now where I have great respect is where I read, you know, of organizations that got into totally different business models and all that kind of stuff where you learn how to commercialize totally different products and all that that's that's big time stuff. I mean, that's that's obviously I think significantly it, different. It, stuff. it reminds me of the uh, sort of three horizon framework of innovation, you know, and a lot of organizations are quite adept at horizon one. You know, it's uh, led by productivity and efficiency. So they're taking what they already know and tweaking it, you know, okay, let's move this a little bit this way, this a little bit this way. We might extend either a margin or a, um, market share or life of a particular SKU oh, yeah. or product. The next horizon, and some organizations do this reasonably well, is slight changes on current. So what you've just said, you know, take one product and let's repackage that product or let's take one capability, this production facility, and apply it to a slightly different audience. And oh, yeah. so those sorts of incremental pivots still have one half in the core. The really hard stuff is the Horizon 3, which is the imagination stuff that bears no resemblance to what you did yesterday. And I think what's interesting is, um, you know, you can have success in any one of these horizons, but the context right now living in an exponential world is the pace and speed at which we need to do this. Yeah. So um, whether it's Horizon 1 or 3, we are facing it under such pressure, whether it's you know, COVID-19 or any exponential technology that's allowing us to either be disrupted because we, you know, aren't pivoting or embracing it or to transform. In terms of your, your experience that you've had before, now trying to predict the foresight of what is coming next. You know, you said, uh, you know, perhaps we weren't smart enough in 2008 to, to see it, but you, you saw the clouds, you saw what was going on. What would you advise organizations right now in terms of the types of skills and types of uh, elements for uh, talent, for their workforces, to ensure that they're going to survive and maybe even thrive in the years to come, what would you advise organizations focus in on? Yeah, I mean, what 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 I'm talking about, I'll tell you what I'm talking about with my current client. That's that's brilliant. You know, yeah. so, my, so my current client, again, I, I won't speak to any specifics, it's not appropriate, but you know, my current client is has has uh, right now indicated that they're, uh, I mean, the, they've said, why waste a good crisis, uh, which I think is actually Jack really Welsh, different. isn't it? Yeah. Really, really smart, right? crisis, yeah. And so they've said, uh, they've said, why don't we, why don't we talk about uh, building, you know, fill in the blank, uh, the name 2.0. And, and they've, and they've, and, and, and I think that I applaud their, their mentality. It's just, it's the appropriate mentality. And, and so, um, and 2.0 will basically, will basically put them not at the forefront. They're not, they're not transcending and going to 20, 2050. 
by getting to 2.0, just to be clear, they'll be, they'll be getting to current state. But, um, but it, it still represents a, a, a transformative leap from where they are today. So, um, so that I applaud their thinking, it's the right way to do it. The way that I'm advising them to think about it, and which will represent a transformative leap for them is, I'm advising them to think about what's the operating model from a, from a structure and pro integrated process way. I believe that if they do that, and they focus, and, and, and I think that there's a couple of, uh, the way that organizations can operate, which gets to the heart of your question, I apologize for the pre-mumble, is that if you have a couple of, I believe that the spine of an organization, I don't care if you uh, have 20,000 people in it or if you have 300 people in it, but the, one of the spine of the organization processes is your strategic planning organization, uh, your strategic planning process, excuse me. Because that process, depending on how the timelines are and if you do it right, it sets you up to be thinking the way that you're talking about. And, and it doesn't have to be super complex with McKinsey or Boston Consulting Group doing it. It just, what it does is it puts you in a forward looking process, mindset. And that mindset, that's what it got, the, that process is exactly what got us to the storm clouds at Tween. And it wasn't overly dramatic or it didn't have any consultants involved with it, but it created the question that led to the process of who's winning and why are we not winning enough? That's all. And so I believe that if you have some sort of a forward looking process that has the appropriate time mindset in it built in, you then as an organization have mitigated the risk of getting caught not looking ahead. It's as simple as that. So that's the first thing I would advise to a client. And then everything else just can flow within that because then you've, you've knocked off the first skill set, which is you're not looking ahead. <laughs> and then secondly, then the capability that already rests in your organization, whether it's uh, industry specific and or, um, you know, uh, function specific, by and large, those that you've hired in are going to fill in the blanks behind it. Um, in my opinion, I'm, uh, I, I, you know, a lot of people debate whether or not strategic thinking is a, s a specific skill or not. I tend to think I, I don't tend to think it's a skill. I think it's, I think that capability is something that exists um, at a natural level and it actually grows over time. I think that if you have enough highly capable people in the room and you, and you focus it, you, you get strategic thinking as an outcome. That's my belief. But, um, but I, so I don't think you hire for strategy skills. I think you just hire really capable people and you give it a really consistent common focus and you probably get strategic thinking if, in the room. But that's my own personal perspective. So I tend not to think in those terms. But, um, but anyhow, that's where I would focus it. That's what I'm actually advising my current client and we'll see if they listen. So the, the challenge then, if I hear that right, you know, in uncertain times and you know unpredictable futures even just thinking about the future you know yeah. is starting point one and having a framework that allows the organization to ponder and think you know everything's created twice first in the mind and then in reality and so give the permission to create in the mind a future maybe now encouraging people to um, be quicker at implementation maybe. Um, yeah. So in a linear world, you could spend time thinking and you could spend maybe 18 months getting a product to market. Yeah. Um, I think one of the big challenges now is the gap between the thinking and then the doing and then the learning. <laughs> so that that you know, open feedback loop is accelerated and speeded through an organization um, I think is a, a key asset in terms of. Um, yeah, I would just have one thing, if I don't, if you don't yeah. mind, quickly. You know, in, in the more uncertainty, um, here's the other thing about strategic planning that I've learned: strategic planning is not about predicting the future either. That's the thing that some people get caught up in. Like, I've got to predict the future because there's capital and there's dollars that I put against it. Yeah. Now, it's actually there's a great book that I read a long time ago, early in my career, called. Um, the Art of the Long View, and it was actually written by someone who ran strategic planning for Shell. So Shell operates in 30-year time frames because that's where their capital gets allocated. And it's all about scenario planning. If you just do scenarios, then that hedges, in quotes, you know, it just create some possible scenarios for crying out loud. 
that at least yep. starts to make it potentially less murky. So even in more uncertain times, to, to use your point, well made, Ross, just just create some scenarios that you can plan your way into and then say, okay, well, we're willing to bet on the possibility of scenarios one and two. And then we'll just plan with that, period. I love it. You know, so yeah. Don't use strategic planning as a way of saying, oh, okay, we have to predict the future. Just create some plausible possibilities and then move forward. That's all. I, I like that. And if the listeners are, uh, you know, are thinking about creating and maybe using uh, science fiction as a stimulus for visualizing possible scenarios. And then it's a bit like, you know, war games. You know, yes. lots of governments totally. have been very good totally. at playing war games. And that is exactly. part of the preparation to then know um, what might come up, what might not come up, what things do we need to work on, what pieces on our board need to be where and when exactly. whether it happens exactly. like that you've got a bit of forethought to it yes. we haven't yes. had this scenario planning and um you know gamified a massive scale for pandemics so we're caught short we don't know how to figure out supply chains you know yes. all, all these kind of challenges so in an organizational level that strategic planning to be built around scenarios be thinking doesn't have to be overly complex but that muscle will start to give more and more strategic output for the organization is what uh, I think you've shared. And is, you know, it doesn't matter, like you say, whether you've got a 20,000 organization, 100,000 organization, or tens or hundreds, you can still use this same kind of principles of, of looking at it. If, um, if you were to advise a leadership team who may be, has been doing that in the past. They've been doing strategic thinking. They go off, they do their executive leadership, you know, off sites, do these types of things. What may be one or two tips in all of your experience that has happened in either the structure or environments that you think would improve the chances of a great outcome of that kind of uh, strategic planning and thinking? What what very simple tips could teams actually implement from your experience practically? Uh, this won't be new uh, to, to some of your listeners or many of your listeners, but it's, it's one that sometimes people haven't considered, but um, uh, you, you, you know, you know yourselves better than you know any of your competitors. So turn the tables on yourself and decide how to, how to beat yourself. And, uh, as though you were doing a competitive thing on yourself. I, do you know, that's just triggered a thought. Uh, are you familiar with X prize, uh, the organization? Have you ever come across them? Yes, so, um, a little bit, uh, background for X prize for context. Uh, it was started by a chap called Peter Diamandis. Uh, he was the founder of singularity university, done lots of very interesting things. And X prize was a competition fee for the first private team to be able to do a suborbital flight. So it's what spawned a lot of the space, private space flight now. And he announced, I think it was in like 1996, a $10 million prize fund for, um, you know, a team to be able to do a suborbital flight. They had to go up um, twice within two weeks, you know, we're with human beings, come back safely, et cetera. And it was one in 2004. And Richard Branson then bought the rights to it, and it's what became Virgin Galactic. And what's interesting in these, these situations of outdoing yourself. Now, XPRIZE, over the you know, last 20 plus years, has been putting together challenges and prizes that then allows the crowd and world to compete to win them. So it de-risks innovation and R&D at a large scale to solve big challenges and big problems. And there was a, um, an aviation company and they've sponsored an avatar prize, which will disrupt them and their industry. So it's really brave uh, about, uh, for example, we can foresee a, a, a necessity where knowledge and where that knowledge is required um, being either at a distance or speed or where a human doesn't want to be. So, for example, um, in disasters, in fires, uh, in these sorts of things, sending humans in who have that knowledge 
uh, we might have access if it's in a certain location or country. If it's in other areas, it might not be even accessible or we have that knowledge. If we could then, instead of fly people or transport them to tsunami situations, if we have deployed avatars that a human can control with their knowledge and see all the senses of temperature of bits and deploy them, that would disrupt a lot of travel. And I thought, how brave for that organization, not for it to happen outside and come and disrupt them, for them to sponsor the disruption happening on themselves. And that's the principle that you just shared, you know, how can we outdo ourselves? Um, yeah. So, so because, yeah, if you know how you would do it and then figure out whether or not you'd do it, well, yep. then you've, you've created the ultimate, um, the ultimate firewall. Yeah, you can either do it or you can mitigate some of that risk uh, around it. You, um, one of the questions I ask at the end of the podcast is, uh, so is there a book that you're currently reading that's really interesting or one that's really uh, affected you over the years? And you, you mentioned one already, um, uh, which was by the chap who worked at Shell. Uh, can you remind us the name of that book? The Art of the Long View. And I read it actually over 25 years ago. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can turn around behind me and go get it because it's still it. in my, in my um, thing. Get are there offer. any other um, books or uh, things that you would like to share that you, um, it's personally affected how you think, what's happened in your career over yeah, time? Yeah, uh, uh, as it regards this, I mean, I've talked about capability. Um, it's probably pretty uh, pretty obscure, but uh, but Elliot Jack's work, uh, J A Q U E S, Elliot, uh, on on uh, his research, he was an M D and a Ph D, um, but his work I was exposed to during my early years at Whirlpool. His work on on his research on human capability was is to this day still what influences me. Um, uh, is uh, is I, I believe it's truth uh, it, uh, about about how uh, people uh, grow over time and and how um, capability is innate and yet uh, it gets better over time and all that and uh, it's not the easiest read um, <laughs> I will confess but but he has a couple of books the one that I like the best is just called Human Capability and uh, it's 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 a dry read but it's it's really really good. Um, but his, his stuff is fantastic. I would recommend Human Capability among everything. Human I'm actually reading The House of Morgan right now by Ron Chernow, which is a complete, you know, it's a tome. It's like the Iliad. Wow. But, uh, but all that about the, the, the J.P. Morgan and all that kind of stuff, it's fascinating. Uh, it's fascinating read. The, it, it is the modern finance and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, it leads me to an interesting um, kind of line of thought around... Uh, a person's talent, and you mentioned innate, and you believe it might be innate uh, versus it's developed. Can you unpack that a little bit more for us um, to to be thinking in that kind of way? Well, well, I, I think I, I, it's not a huge debate. I think I think our talents are naturally innate. I mean, what you were born with, you were born with. It's a function of DNA, obviously, and all that. And 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 I don't think that's a huge debate, but. What's interesting for a business, I think, for an organization is you, you need to find, and this is why we were working with Elliot uh, at Whirlpool, is, you know, um, we were trying to say, okay, we need to find who has the innate skills to eventually be capable of running a business unit around the world, uh, eventually sitting in the C-suite. Um, you know, as I like to say, and this may sound perverse, but, you know, horses without breeding don't run in the Kentucky Derby. I mean, it's as simple as that. And so... Um, so, uh, and so it, early in my career, I ran a, a global development program. And so my job was to go into, um, go into, you know, you know, Wharton, University of Michigan, NCAD, and like, and I, I had 20, 20 minutes to interview people who were first year MBAs and say, okay, which one of these are the future stars, right? And so... I had to find out who had the innate capability and, and you can't determine it off of a resume. I mean, so you can just, so, so I had to figure out and, and, uh, and I found one question that I could get people engaged on and I could listen to them speak and what, and what Elliot teaches you has taught me at least was if you get people engaged and you watch them process their information, you can actually determine if you roughly know how old they are, you can see where they are in their thought processes and then you can determine what trajectory that they're going to be on of their capability. And so I believe that 
And I just believe that's truth. And I had it play out with several, with multiple candidates. And you could project. It doesn't mean that's, a, that's what they're going to become, but it just means that's what they have the capability to become. Yeah. And Is so, a higher propensity and, for that exactly. outcome. And obviously, you don't become something just because you have the capability. You got to actually put the work in. You got you to be engaged over time. When you combine that with stuff that, that, that you know, there's another great book called The Lessons of Experience that was done in the late 80s, early 90s by, uh, by the people uh, that eventually became one of the Lominger people, people from familiar with Lominger, but, um, you know, which says, you know, the certain kinds of experiences fill people in in their gaps, whether it's being part of a startup, being part of a turnaround, your first supervisor experience, yada, yada, yada. Um, if you are just really engaged, and, uh, and, and, and curious, when you combine that with innate capability, that's how you get great careers by and large. And so um, if, if people are engaged, curious, and they have capability, you're gonna have great careers by and large and you're committed, right? And, and I happen to believe if you throw in a, a healthy sense of just decent values, by and large, people have really, really good careers. So um, uh, that's, that's how I look at these things. So it's a little bit of both. I'd love to get your thoughts on um, a couple of aspects that are going on in my mind at the moment. You know, we're in the early stages of our uh, business. And whilst I've had 20 years of running other businesses, you know, you talk about the experience, you know, when you have to fire a load of people, when you win something, when you lose something, all of those things, you then decide what do I want to let go of? What do I want to repeat? <laughs> what do I want to do better next time? You know, all of those uh, areas. And something that is endlessly fascinating me is this challenge around how our values of being good human beings through transformation and change and disruption. And all of the clouds, predictions, whatever it might be, is that there's going to be significant change. Reskilling and upskilling change. There's going to be huge layoffs, redundancies, the US at the moment, you know, it's at an all time high of these kinds of situations of my identity wrapped up in who I am and what my work is, the pressures on mental health, the pr pressures for organizations to, you know, ensure employability inside or outside of their organization is a concept around ethical redundancy. And I'm interested, you know, we've probably got maybe five minutes left. Uh, you've faced transformations of, you know, workforces yeah. and doing it in a humane way. And often what I've seen happen is here's your check that will allow you to go and figure out what next. If you're slightly higher up, you might then get some access to counseling or support or various things. But at scale, it's very hard to support people through how to find what their next career path is when they've been valuable and they no longer are valuable for whatever situation. How might organizations do better um, in the face of hard challenges of a workforce at scale no longer being valuable uh, or able to provide value for that organization? Um, what would you like to see uh, change and shift and how might we navigate this very real situation better? We only have five minutes, huh? <laughs> Maybe we'll make it a bit longer uh, on the episode. Let's see how it goes. We, we, we should, we, we could, we could get a whole group of people together. Uh, I, I think, I think you hit a massive, massive, uh, massive vein, if you will, of, of opportunity, right? Um, you know, because business is to me Darwinian by nature, right? And now, now we're talking about a whole bunch of people. I, I'll just, I mean, I, I think, I think it's the number one issue facing the next twenty years in the United States is that um, is that the economy is really, really good at being Darwinian, and uh, and there's a whole raft of, there's, there's a whole swath of the population that's going to be victimized because uh, they're about to discover that, um, that through AI, the world, it's really, really clear that AI is gonna expose a lot of people who don't have opposable thumbs, uh, you know. So the question is, 
is uh, the free marketplace going to fill in the blanks and help people find new opposable thumbs? Um, ultimately, oh, maybe, probably not fast enough is the answer. Um, and so as a believer, I'm a personal believer that business is best suited among all the social institutions to actually help people. That's one of the reasons I chose to go into business and not some other form of work. So I, I ultimately believe that, um, that businesses will find opportunity and therefore fill the blanks in. Now, um, I would like to see people ultimately not just count on someone else to go do it for them. And so I think that in a world where you're leaving people behind as you transform, I would like to see it not just be left to the right managements and Lee Heck Harrisons of the world because they're not going to do it. Now, they could try, but that's not really what they're skilled at. Um, and so they're not equipped to do it. If they were really enterprising, they might build those models, but they're really not, they're not capable of doing that. It's not what they're in the business of doing. They would be an example of trying to transform their business model in a way they're not skilled at doing, right? So, so the question to me is, in a world where post-secondary education is clearly falling flat in that regard, to me, that's an opportunity where post-secondary education institutions, there's 3,700 colleges and universities in this country, and there's way, that's way too many, right? So I would say that's an example of how the post-secondary education, where 3,700, some number of those 3,700 could probably figure out how to fill that void, is the short answer for our five-minute conversation. Yeah, I think that's it's- the opportunity. It's such an exciting opportunity to where, you know, I founded this organization with Mike to make sure no one's left behind. Yeah. We're not going to do that alone. That's going to be through loads of collaborations. Yeah. And to me, it's not about equality of everyone being the same. It's about co-elevation. So wherever oh. someone is, that they have an opportunity for a tomorrow that looks brighter than yesterday. Yeah. And we need to do it fast and we need to do it at scale. And the reality of all of the knock-on effects, mental health, physical health, all of these things, if we get this wrong, it's a big deal. And I think organizations um, need to play a role in how they help uh, serve and support. And it has to be two-way. You're 100% right. I believe the same. You know, we, it can't be done for them but it has to have an opportunity, a pathway and a roadmap for them to get back to whatever is chapter two, three or four, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I respect what Amazon's doing when they, they go into their, their DCs and they say, look, we'll, we'll do tuition assistance because we assume at some point you're going to want to leave us. And so then they look at tuition assistance related to the, the employability in the market that in which you're operating. Yep. I think that's a nice, I think it's a good thought. Um, I, I happen to think that a public-private partnership that has a sort of broader reach, you know, I, I, living here in Phoenix, you've got, you've got Arizona State where the president is saying basically his strategic plan is I want to educate the world, right? I want to educate everybody. I don't think you leave it up, but there's an interesting partnership possibility, right? Where, yeah. where you know, and you've got University of Phoenix that clearly has, and, and, and Southern New Hampshire, you know, you've got these schools that have put their toes in the water on providing broad access to education. Um, it requires some more thought, but there are, there are partners out there that have started to go down this path. So anyhow, I want to be respectful of the time, but it's yeah. a really, it's a great thought and it's a ripe, I mean, talk about an industry that deserves disruption. I mean, post-secondary education, second highest inflation cost inflation rate behind pharmaceutical industry or healthcare. Um, where's the value? I mean, the whole conversation about forgiving student debt. I mean, if that isn't a cry for saying, you know, look, we're not getting value from what you're doing. There's yep. a bifurcation going on. I mean, the whole place. So there's a huge reorganization coming, isn't there? Um, mm -hmm. And I, uh, I hope that we come out um, with the least casualties uh, as possible. Um, and that's going to take, you know, innovation, maybe at horizon three level. <laughs> but it's been a, a somebody's going to be horizon three. Somebody's going to be. Um, as a final piece, uh, if there is one area that um, 
somebody who's listening to this has been inspired by some of your thoughts and pieces, how might they be able to reach out, get in touch with you, or uh, if they're in an organization that would like to know more about the Sierra Institute and those sorts of things, how do people get in touch with you, Michael? Oh, well, uh, let me see. Gosh, I would have expected you might ask that. Um, uh, if link, just link in with me. Just uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, and and uh, I'll be uh, I'll be glad to 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 link back in with you, and uh, I'll look forward to that connection. Brilliant! It's been a real pleasure. Have Thank a great you. rest of your day, and uh, look forward to to continuing our conversation uh, over Absolutely. time. Absolutely, been a blast. Do you have the level of adaptability to survive and thrive the rapid changes ahead? Has your resilience got more comeback than a yo-yo? Do you have the ability to unlearn in order to reskill, upskill and break through? Find out today and uncover your adaptability profile and score, your AQ. Visit aqai.io to gain your personalized report across 15 scientifically validated dimensions of adaptability. For a limited time, enter code PODCAST65 for a complimentary AQ Me assessment. AQAI, transforming the way people, teams, and organizations navigate change. Thank you for listening to this episode of Decoding AQ. Please make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast directory, and we'd love to hear your feedback. Please do leave a review and be sure to tune in next time for more insights from our amazing guests.